Does a high octane fuel actually make your engine go better and therefore is it worth you running the good stuff? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. TV in my eye, fact me, recently, quietly, online. Thus, what about cars that recommend premium but do not require it? The Ford Mustang EcoBoost is like that. Ford says to get all that 310 horsepower, you'll need to run premium. Mid-grade will give you around 300. Not sure how true that is. The short answer here, yeah, pretty true. About 3%, that sounds kind of in the ballpark. But while you could measure this, you'll never actually feel it and you'll never, therefore, notice it. Engine power and fuels is one of the most misunderstood topics out there among enthusiasts and ordinary drivers alike. Engineering for dummies, a really high compression ratio, totally a good thing, in theory. Expansion over a greater range during the power stroke means you get more performance and greater efficiency. So I love it already. Sign me up. But there's a problem. Fuel-air mixtures are not, in fact, infinitely tolerant of compression. At some point, the mixture starts to burn spontaneously too early. And that's what engine knock or pinging is. You've heard of that. Knock is when combustion literally goes off <coughs> half-cocked. If this occurs, the delightfully synchronous ballet of sucking, squeezing, banging and blowing down there. Just like those numerous free online documentaries, the ballet of sucking, squeezing, banging and blowing is upset by virtue of early blowing, which can spoil so many otherwise satisfying encounters, I think you'd agree. Engine knock at high revs and big throttle inputs can destroy your engine, so the designers really do try to avoid that, oddly enough, and sometimes they avoid it by using high octane fuel. And at its core, octane rating is simply a scale that defines a fuel's tolerance for compression. The higher the rating, the more tolerant of high compression the fuel is. High octane fuels do not burn hotter, whatever. That crap is up there with we fake the moon landing. It's knock resistance. End of story. That's what high octane ratings are about. Octane rating is an applied chemistry thing. There's a very particular kind of octane, the chemical, called iso-octane. Sometimes it goes by the catchy name of 224-trimethylpentane. You can run it in a particular test engine with variable compression. It's kind of the chemical standard for 100 octane. 98 Ron fuel has the same knock resistance as a mixture of 98% iso-octane and 2% Heptane. That's just how this works. Maybe this is too much detail. I don't know. It's a percentage. Adding confusion here is, of course, the three different flavours of octane rating that we use around the world. RON is the research octane number where the special test engine is run at 600 RPM for the test. Then there's the motor octane number, or the MON, same basic process, except the test engine runs at 900 RPM. MON is always lower than RON by about 8 to 12 points. And then there's the anti-knock index, or the ACI, which is the average of RON and MON. So ACI equals RON plus MON divided by 2. In most countries, including Australia, RON is used routinely, but in the US, in Canada and Brazil, they use ACI. And the upshot is ACI is always about four to six points lower than RON. And I point this out because it is a very bad idea for anyone in a RON country, like Australia, to download a US spec for a car and then take that as gospel without knowing the different rating systems. You might draw the entirely erroneous conclusion that standard gasoline is okay when in fact premium is required. Because an Aki of 90 is actually a RON of about 95. The Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT is like that. You should never use a lower octane rating than the manufacturer recommends, never. But you can use a higher octane rating all day long. There's absolutely no technical problem with doing that. Choreography, so important in 
basically everything, but especially engines. An engine at 6,000 RPM is doing the suck, squeeze, bang, blow ballet 50 times a second per cylinder. And the precise timing of the spark, so critical. The spark has to occur at exactly the right time in relation to the movement of the piston. Basically, the spark needs to occur early enough to give the flame front sufficient breathing space so that the pressure can build up and generate a deliciously satisfying and effective blow, just like in those documentaries. A critical thrust just as the piston kicks over top dead centre. I know, if they taught applied science in schools with this level of innuendo, the entire population would emerge technically cognizant. Horny, perhaps, but tech-savvy horny, and trust me, that's the best kind. I'm sure the social justice warriors would be appalled. If I were king, I'd just take them all on a nice cruise in the South Pacific and never bring them back. This suck etc. ballet business. It happens right down in the millisecond domain. It's impossible to conceive of the timing without being a mechanical Jedi and using the force. And the dark side is always there calling your engine, inviting it to knock. It never stops. This is of course why every modern engine has a knock sensor, a little acoustic microphone that listens for engine knock. It's all they do. The most boring job ever. A modern engine manages its ignition timing in a feedback loop where the engine keeps advancing the ignition timing until the knock sensor detects incipient knock and then it just backs off a bit. Amazing. It does this continuously too. Advance, a little knock, back off, repeat many, many times a second. The point about high octane fuel is it will also tolerate a little bit more advance before it starts to ping and that will deliver a little bit more torque at the crank meaning a little bit more performance. The key word here, a little bit. Certainly not the same as changing the compression ratio in design and the difference here is quite minor, a few percent as noted. People who tell you, mate, mate, she just runs so much better on 98 or whatever, smoother, cooler, etc. or goes heaps better, they're bullshitting you. It's at best a minor difference. And here's how it plays in practice. People like TV in my eye, noted earlier, and you should never watch TV. TV will rot your brain and suck out your soul, leave you a withered husk. You should watch YouTube instead, and in particular, this channel. Intellectually stimulating, spiritually fulfilling, and I think you'll agree, a whole lot classier. So your engine might be doing a particular job on 91 Ron fuel, punting you down the freeway at 100 k's an hour, something. If you wave Harry Potter's wand and you swap magically to 98 and keep everything the same, same throttle position, same road, same everything, experimental control, you'd look down and you would see the speedo on 105 or something. Why is it so? It's because the engine listens for knock and advances the timing. The high octane allows slightly more advance and that delivers slightly more performance, hence 105. Footnote for the tech savvy, high octane fuel is also a little more dense and this also contributes slightly, slightly to the result. Alternatively, you could close the throttle slightly and cruise back at 100 again. In other words, there's a slight increase in fuel economy when you switch to a higher octane fuel. Keyword, slight. I'd suggest there's a big difference between planning a top speed run or racing, in which case high octane fuel makes perfect sense. You'll get vestigially more peak power, and sometimes vestigially is all it takes to win. But for average driving, this more power presumption is absolutely nuts. A ridiculous way to look at fuel. And this is because in average driving, you don't need an engine capable of delivering more power. If you want more power than you're making right now, you just open the throttle a little bit more. The engine rapidly makes more power if you do this. Peak power is kind of irrelevant for mundane driving because it requires only, I don't know, 25 or 30 kilowatts to drive you down the road at 100. It's very difficult to exploit peak power in ordinary driving. Even when you're overtaking, you might be at peak power for a few seconds 
and then you change gear, right? Peak power is mostly a kind of interesting comparative specification for engines, but it's not all that practical. Here's the thing. High octane fuel delivers more power or better economy. They're flip sides of the same efficiency equation. But in most markets around the world, the small improvement in efficiency is smashed into irrelevant and also economic irrationality by the substantial difference in the cost of premium petrol. What really matters to most people when they drive is the cost per kilometer of driving. And for whatever reason, the manufacturers of premium fuel, they do not offer it at an economically rational price. And you can listen to the bullshit marketing all day long and you'll draw the conclusion that what premium fuel generally does is just clean your engine better than regular. In other words, you will certainly get better fuel economy on premium, but driving will be more expensive per kilometre because of the additional cost of the fuel. So for most car owners, premium gasoline is a kind of nice idea that simply does not ever add up. My advice for average car owners is run the fuel the manufacturer specifies. You cannot hurt an engine by running premium when the manufacturer tells you regular will suffice. All you'll be doing there is wasting a little bit of money. But running regular in an engine that demands premium will be a very bad day for you ultimately and at the same time a very good day for the service department. I'm John Cadogan. That's my cock. I hope this atrocious innuendo has helped you understand a fairly boring technical topic and learn more about what goes on down there. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>